and welcome everyone to our fourth session in our EMEA Cisco Collaboration Future of Work series. The session today is an analyst session. It's actually being run by a gentleman by the name of Scott Edwards, who's a fellow director at Cisco. He recently recorded the analyst session with some of the most experienced, independent industry pundits available in the world. Their insights and information, I'm sure you're going to find very, very relevant to your planning around the future of work. Enjoy. Hello and welcome everybody to our virtual summit on workplace transformation. We're excited to continue this series and I'm re really excited today to for, for this panel discussion that we're going to have. We've brought in four well-known analysts that cover this space of collaboration and uh, very excited to have them with us today. So I'm thrilled to introduce each of these analysts. We'll first introduce Daniel Newman, who is the principal analyst and founding partner of Futurum Research. Daniel, welcome. Hey, Scott. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here to talk about uh, workplace transformation. All right. Thanks, Daniel. We've also got Jim Lundy, who is the founder, CEO, and lead analyst at Aragon Research. Jim, welcome. Great to be here, Scott. Looking forward to it. All right, we'll move on to Dave Michaels, who's the principal analyst and founder of Talking Points. Hello, Dave. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me here today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. And we also have with us Craig Durr, who is a senior analyst at Wayne House Research. Craig, welcome. Thank you, Scott. Good to be here. Looking forward to talking with everyone. Awesome. Now, let's get started. I, I know all of you have been covering the collaboration space <clears throat> for many years. Uh, you know this space. You know what's going on. But I assume that none of you uh, had in your annual predictions something like this uh, that happened here in 2020 with the complete change of how work is getting done. Oh, that's you actually incorrect, Scott. I, I've, been, I've been predicting this for every year for the past 10, 15 years, actually. Um, I, 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 I've been a real champion of work from home, and I think that uh, – I, I always thought it was inevitable, and so I'm just glad the industry or the environment finally caught up to that reality. <laughs> they, they've caught up to what you've been saying is going to happen forever. Okay, so Dave, we'll give it to you that you had predicted this. Uh, the rest of us were in the dark, and we're just ca catching up. Um, but I know each of you are speaking and, and hearing from organizations as they go down this path and are trying to figure out this whole work-from-home model and, and how this might become, in some ways, the new norm. So really want to get your thoughts on, on this. So, Daniel, let me, let me ask you the, the, the first question, and, and that is this. How well have you seen organizations now adapt to what they're seeing, this immediate transformation of work? What's, what, what have you seen? It's been a fascinating uh, sort of enterprise experiment to watch. Obviously, everything going on in the world is 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 – sad and it's it's scary and it's a time of high anxiety and i think you got to be on tone right now when we talk about all this stuff so i'm going to make sure i keep all that in perspective here but we've had the opportunity to talk to cios and cxos of some of the largest uh companies not uh, in all all different industries but including tech and one of the most fascinating observations we've had is just how unprepared companies were just how unprepared companies were that actually are in the technology and do collaboration on the regular. Um, I think there was a real comfort in connectivity and mobile devices and the fact that people were able to work flexibly for the past few years, um, really the past decade, that that was the same thing as being able to be permanently displaced in a work from home situation. So for instance, you know, you had a, a laptop in a wireless card or a personal hotspot. And it was like, oh, I guess everybody's fit to work at home. But there's so many other considerations. There's, you know, everything from having enough v VPN access um, and the bandwidth and the capacity to what are people's connectivity, what, the what is their connectivity like at home? So, you know, before it was like, well, if you were displaced, maybe you could run up to Starbucks and get their high speed network. Well, that's not true anymore, right? And, you know, so we're basically all kind of, we instantly became, um, affected by what our infrastructure was in that moment in time. And for many companies, like in the, in the, in the Valley, it was literally, you left work on Friday and as of Saturday, you were going to work at home. So if you regularly worked on a workstation, so we saw really interesting things with some semiconductor companies, like a lot of their employees work on powerful workstations and they were sent home and maybe they have a, a laptop, a 13 inch laptop 
and they're going to go home with that 13-inch laptop that even if it's powerful, isn't even a fraction of as powerful as the workstation in the office. We've seen these effects. We've also seen a lot of effects of, you know, uh, software wasn't deployed widely. Uh, employees weren't using comfortably technology like video. Like they weren't turning their video on for a long period of time. So that's an example. Um, the security isn't necessarily in place. People didn't have good behaviors with security. Mobile device management wasn't turned on. Um, data, data sovereignty, data protection, uh, the security wasn't wasn't uh, organized. So there's a million directions I could take this. And I'm sure all the other analysts want to hop in. So I don't want to I don't want to hijack this whole discussion here. But we've talked to several of the like I said, largest companies, even in tech, and most of them have, have would acknowledge that probably less than half of their workforce was was set up to truly be displaced and put in the work from home situation on a full time basis, which is crazy because I've been doing it for almost two decades. And for me, it's just business as usual. The only difference is I haven't seen that those flight crews that I regularly talk to in my trips from Seattle or San Francisco. I, I kind of miss them. So shout out in case I in case you're watching this uh, particular podcast. Daniel, I'll, I'll add on to that actually. So we were looking at some data, and and you're one of the last things you said. People being enabled to actually work from home is really surprising. The number, and you can look at that. Obviously. As, as a country, you know, you wouldn't expect the service industry and uh, other chairs up, you know, they don't have that capability. Maybe some workers might be able to call centers, things like that. But even in what we would call that white collar ban, looking at some Bureau of Labor statistic data, there was less than 50%. I think we came up to be like 45% that had the capability of working home. And that's not even the ability of being trained. And like you said, in the process of actually doing it, having access to it and then making it part of your natural workflow is, is, a huge step forward, even even more so. And I agree with you. People weren't ready. It, it was a it was a you've got 14 days to figure this out type thing. Yeah, Jim, I, I'm I'm curious to get your take on this as as far as how are organizations able to keep things going in the current paradigm? What has worked? What what hasn't worked? What are the things that you've seen from that perspective? Well, you know. I just say that, you know, having myself managed a global team for like 12 years that worked remotely, um, there there are a lot of, uh, you know, best practices that companies can look at. There's also a mindset. Um, and I think the thing that I would just say that, you know, going back to even the SARS, uh, you know, outbreak that was, you know, more than 10 years ago, we didn't have these things ten more than 10 years ago. So you can do a lot of work on a mobile device. You might not have your office set up. You might not have everything perfect, but there's an awful lot of work that can get done. Even if you said, hey, I had to leave my computer at work. Um, you know, we sent people at home. My admin took her big display home because she wanted to use it at home. Um, so I think, I think people are coping. I think that, I think part of the problem is it's the shock of working from home. And I think that's one of the things because you can, like I said, you got a mobile phone. And so you can do things even if you don't have the perfect setup, but I think it's more of the culture and the shock. And so you see a lot of people doing, you know, virtual happy hours and you know, remote podcasts like this, but it comes down to a mindset. Uh, now there are a lot of firms that are set up to be virtual uh, more than you think. Um, there's a lot of governments that are set up for telework as that's the, 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 the trade term that's used. Um, but there's a lot of people that work within those that were not set up. So I think the other analysts were absolutely spot on that there's a lot of people that are set up, but there's a lot of people that aren't. And so that's caused a little bit of scramble. It's caused a lot of demand, I think, for people to provide communications and collaboration solutions. I think the demand's uh, you know, out of the, uh, uh, you know, off the charts. But you can thrive working from home. You can actually do a lot of business as a company, uh, even though people aren't physically there. It's just there's things that you need to do that keep people connected. Yeah. Dave, I, 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 so again, you, you, you know, we're, we're all following you. You've been doing this for a long time, <laughs> but, but what has worked, what hasn't worked for these companies from your perspective? Well, obviously the companies that, you know, the knowledge workers have had the big benefits. I think, I think it's been, you know, Amazon has been amazing 
uh, com- comparison because they have all these knowledge workers where they're telling them to stay home and they also have all these warehouse workers and delivery workers and grocery workers and they're saying you have to work and you know there's the reality is not all jobs can be done remotely and and uh, and a lot of businesses are figuring this out um and we're and, and we're struggling as we adapt and 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 even the people that could do remote work uh like many of us on this on this uh on this meeting right now um it's always been a choice it's always been i i have the choice to go in the office I, or it's a benefit if i want to work at home and all of a sudden when you take the choice away and say no you have to do it this way things kind of break a little bit and and we we're having to figure out well oh wait i can't i i do need maybe if i was doing a certain kind of meeting i would go into the office and if i wasn't doing that kind of meeting i'd do that at home and now i have to do everything at home so i have to kind of revisit everything that my I have to make everything work at home, and and that's been a challenge. Um, the this shows, you know, basically overnight, uh, we're trying to figure out work from home, and we're trying to figure out digital transformation at the same time. And it's two things that that you know the enterprise communications industry has really been talking a lot about for the past you know five ten years, but but we're it's a crash course. We have to learn how to do this right now and it's it's been a it's been a challenge and struggle for a lot of organizations yeah and, and i think you know there's there's a large group of the workforce that can work from home and 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 some that can't and we'll we'll get into some of those i think as we go down a little bit later in this discussion but let's talk about the those that are able now to work from home or been asked and in a sense forced to work from home and that physical work environment. So, Craig, if you want to kind of get your perspective on this, uh, as far as how can remote workers set up the best physical home environment for them to enable, to enable them to be productive? And, oh, Craig, sorry, Craig, you're on mute there. That's, that's another that's another challenging thing, right? <laughs> I'll go on mute. Okay, sorry about that. You, that I did that as an example of what one of the problems is of working from remote. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but it's it, it actually it, it's a great segue into that idea. I mean, a lot of people are 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 not used to it. We can talk about things like technology, right? You know, and and people their their companies can set them up. Do I have good monitors? Do I have good an ergonomic workspace? Do I have things that are allowing me to communicate well? Like we all right now are using some sort of USB connected microphone or speaker. Uh, Daniel's got a wonderful setup in, there in front of him as well because he does a lot of podcasts that, that I listen to exactly. And uh, but but and, and a great camera as well too. I mean the technology is important. I think the other thing to think about is is your workflows and adjusting your workflows. In in for a lot of us, uh, this group in particular, we are work used to working on deadlines that might be month by month versus. A lot of these new remote workers have a lot of codependency on, on coworkers. I, I have to talk to Jim before I can finish this project. I need to talk to Sue and then pass it on to her and what have you. So adjusting those workflows and use, utilizing the tools that are available, this is where some of these, these modern day, you know, unified communication solutions come into play, right? The ability where you're gonna start doing things like having a constant content flow or messaging where you can either IM or send a, a quick group chat message as well. And then the meeting aspect as well too. Maybe it's just let's escalate it to an audio call or a video call. And and I think Daniel joked about that, but that's one of the key things I think about technology is people have to get comfortable turning on their cameras. It's twofold. You have to be comfortable to do that because you're going to get more of that connection that you need. But at the same time, specific to what's taking place right now, um, you you're allowing a, an element of empathy because a lot of us are being thrown to work from home right now. And right through that door, I've got four children. And I'll be surprised if one doesn't come knocking on it right now as we're, t- we're talking about it. And so there's an element of um, adjusting your workflow as well to where you are and, and building from there. We're all thrown into this 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 challenge right now. Um, but but you know with empathy and with with our own technology enablement, I, I, there's there's paths forward. Yeah, Craig, I think I think you make a, a few really great points. And by the way, thanks for the call out on the setup. Um, <laughs> Listen, that is probably one of the first things a lot of people just don't think about is when your every meeting becomes this kind of meeting, how much more important it is. There's going to be a huge run on this kind of gear. I actually am going to see like the work from home kit 
is going to become a new norm. We're going to start to see more companies. Um, we've already heard the OEMs are exploding right now in terms of uh, PCs. Uh, they can't keep them on the shelf. You can have money and you literally can't buy them. Between the education industry, um, the enterprise government, everyone's realized that if we need to quickly mobilize our workforce or our students and work from home, the equipment they have isn't good enough. And, and Jim, you're right, pointing back a, a decade ago, the we did have iPhones, but they weren't nearly as capable. Networks were not as fast as they are today. Um, the advent of 5G will make this even better. But having the right equipment, I, I still have so many meetings where people, you know, and, and, and our meeting volume has probably doubled or tripled in terms of, of internet meetings, even though we usually did them all the time. But we're seeing a tremendous amount of low, um, low bandwidth cameras or low quality cameras, people that don't know have any etiquette in terms of how to use a camera. You're looking up people's noses. You're looking at half of their faces. Lighting. Um, they don't know how to, you know, get themselves to a, a blank canvas or some sort of wall that's not distracting. I mean, um, you're seeing terrible audio. You're seeing noisy headphones. You're seeing, you know, the joke, a conference call in real life where you'd hear people going to the bathroom. Um, but there's, there is two things at play, too. And, and you mentioned this. Um, part of this is, behaviorally speaking, this group that you're talking to, and Scott, you as the moderator, are talking to a group of work-at-home professionals. We are literally, this is like business as usual for us. We are used to this. We're used to people that don't know what they're doing. The only difference was we sort of were more tolerable because we didn't have as high of expectations. But at this point, companies are going to need to teach people how to, how to have proper etiquette, how to get on these platforms, and then make sure that their equipment can support it. Um, and the one other thing you mentioned, I just want to touch on, and I'm sure we could talk about this more outside of this particular question is, um, we take for granted how big of a change this is for people. I really do believe that. You know, were companies ready? I said no, not really. Were people ready? And I'll also say no, not really. People weren't ready for this. And people really, um, by and large, you know, liked flex work, meaning they liked being able to leave early so they can catch their kids' soccer game, or they liked leaving, um, being able to come in a little bit late or take a call on the way to work. And that's where collaboration has really taken off. But we've seen the volume jump in collaboration platform usage this has always been there you know i said we could have taken events online 20 years ago there were platforms that could have taken most of the events that we've been attending online it's our social um wiring that has kept us doing live meetings it's everything in between keynotes in between panels in between sessions and one-on-one -on -one meetings it's the coffee it's the the wine the dinners um, and for people that go to an office every day, it's the water cooler. It's lunch with people that they get to know. It's the happy hour after work. These are the things that are missing, and the technology cannot instantly replace. Um, and I don't care about a, a video happy hour where everyone raises a beer. It just isn't quite the same as the ambiance. So that's the stuff that people are still really getting used to and adapting to, and I don't see it happening overnight. I, th I think the equipment is is important, obviously very very important for some positions, but I think that stuff you just touched on there is is uh, much more important for a lot of people. The uh, the you know we we talk about enterprise communications and we talk about enterprise collaboration, but the two go together. And and the communications we talk you know the meetings and stuff we can do that online fairly effectively, but the collaboration is what I think is proving to be more challenging for a lot of people right now. And so, you know, if, I, if I'm writing a document in the office, I might have an idea that I get up and kind of bounce off a colleague in the next cube over. I might, you know, share some ideas with somebody in the elevator or whatever. And, and that's kind of a form of collaboration where you're kind of ideating and, and developing your thoughts. And then you go back and work on this document and then ta-da, here's my document, look what I've done. And, and now people are trying to do that kind of on their own and they're not realizing that so many of these tools, whether it be messaging solutions or even video solutions or even the telephone or even email, whatever, that, that, that we have to collaborate differently. We have to create those water cooler conversations, those elevator rides, those over the cube, conversations in a more deliberate and a, and and meaning and a, a, a different way than we used to but the technology is there and we and so it's not just communications it's that collaborations component that i think is is what's challenging a lot of people hey dave this is jim i i agree with you and one of the things i've been an advocate for is the idea of using uh messaging or team collaboration to be some of that water cooler 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I haven't sent an email at my firm for the last like four years because we have a lot of millennials and they don't read emails. But, but I think for one on one, your point about, hey, I want to collaborate with you. Uh, I find that to be uh, very effective, but we still think it's pretty early days. A lot of uh, companies have isolated instances of, of messaging. They haven't rolled it out completely. And so that, that may be one of the opportunities, I think, in, in the COVID era of uh, investing more so that you can have more cross-team cross, cross team collaboration. Yeah, I, I think that I think that makes sense. Uh, that's interesting. You guys haven't sent an email in like, in like four years, right? These these company, all company com yeah. company company email right. These these forms of communications are adapting as our as our workflow adapts as well. And uh, I think that's interesting. Craig, you also had mentioned that we need to make sure we have empathy in our in our in our, now our new norm, right? Our work environment. We have we're going to have pets. We're going to have family members. We're going to have outside noises that we just. You know what? That's just life, and that's just how it is right now, and and, and that's going to be okay. Like we don't need to freak out to have the the perfect, completely well done setup and and quiet environment in order to work. We work now where we are, and and make it make it work, right? That that's the empathy statement. I mean, we're going to evolve as as a workforce. Um, I think the world's going to do this. I think the U.S. actually is going to be leading this because we've had a little bit more of this in place. I think uh, in, in some areas. The idea of I'm working at home now, this is an informal meeting, I'm working at home now, this is a formal meeting, here's the sign, please don't come in. Um, or I'm just at home working quiet hours and things like this. Uh, there was a term that, that um, has been used in the past. We used to talk about work-life balance and the idea people would talk about is okay, so five o'clock I'm shutting down, it's time for the family or my friends, we're gonna go have a drink and relax. It, it really, even before we got to where we are, we were at a point of where we were blending work and personal life. And it was these micro moments were taking place. Who hasn't stopped or gone for a dentist appointment at lunch? Or who hasn't taken a call at their kid's baseball game? Because it happens to be a different time zone coming over. And we're becoming more attuned to managing that. I think what's key about that is this. Those things will happen. And we have to be proactive to manage that as opposed to be managed by them. It's okay to say, hey, I can't take this call right now because I have a family commitment. Or to work with your family and say, look, I have this moment here where this is work, but it allows me to be close to you here uh, for, you know, in 30 minutes when I'm done with this phone call or what have you. And I think the proactiveness of managing that is going to be a paradigm shift that some people are going to struggle with, but the ones that are on top of it, I think, will, will adopt it as normal. Yeah, so very well well said. So, Dave, I'm, I'm curious to get your point now that now this is kind of remote work is the new norm. One that we didn't expect, but one we're all working and dealing with. Is that the future? Or are we just going to go back to the, the way things were before? What do you think? I, uh, the new norm, I, you know, the norm is always changing, right? But, um, you know, I think Jim mentioned earlier the, the uh, SARS uh, pandemic uh, 15 years ago or so. Um, so this has happened before. There's been other reasons that have caused people to work at home and uh, temporarily. And then after that fear or other issue goes away, we end up going back to the office. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in this call, I, 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 I've been predicting work at home to be mainstream for years and years and been wrong about it, but I'm not changing my tune. I think that, I think that uh, we've been accelerated into this environment and I don't think it's uh, gonna go away. And that's for several reasons, actually. Uh, that this, this time is different, and I could back that up. Uh, the first reason is really because working from home has never been more easier. Uh, people have the bandwidth. People have cloud-delivered services that work just as well at home as they do in the office. Um, we have affordable equipment and um, uh, services. We have, you know, uh, Jim talked about the uh, the smartphone, but laptops, uh, Chromebooks, all, all kinds of devices are fairly inexpensive these days. Uh, cloud services from from Office 365 to G Suite to to uh, to WebEx are all fairly uh, uh, price effective to use for uh, uh, staying connected, and and also these services have never been more intuitive. I mean, I mean, I, I could remember the video conferencing room in one of my first 
jobs. It had a remote control larger than most computer keyboards. It ha- it was a very intimidating place to be. You, the room was locked. You had to get a, a note from a vice president to get access to the room. It was very intimidating. The whole thing was intimidating. But now things are, you know, you walk in and there's a, a start button or join button, and, and, and it's just very intuitive. So, so the first thing is it's never been easier. The second thing is, um, and I think this is really important, is that it's more desirable. I mean, I, I three words for you, open floor plans. Um, the office has become a terrible place to work uh, and, and nobody really wants to be there. We've seen the WeWork fiasco. There's, a, there's lots of stuff going on that the office is just not where people wanna work anymore. Um, and so that's the second reason. The third reason I mentioned it earlier is digital transformation. And, and so, you know, we used to meet in, in meetings and in groups in, in the same room because we had to talk about something physical. We had to talk about a prototype or a device or a blueprint or, or artwork or something that was, that was created and we had to discuss it and look at it. Or maybe it was a, a presentation on, the, on a screen or something along those lines. But after five years of digital transformation, more and more of the work we do is on a display uh, whether it be a blueprint or artwork or something else that we can easily share remotely and present. Uh, and um, and then and then four, and this is the last one I just touched on uh, a moment ago, is the nature of collaboration and and things like um, Google Docs or or mm-hmm. some of the more collaborative doc. Uh, uh, applications we're using allow us to collaborate at the same time on the same document. Uh, there's also things like uh, like uh, WebEx Teams that allow us to share content very easily and to message with each, with each other. Um, and, uh, and, and video services like the one we're using right now is is really a bit, been a game changer in the sense that, you know, in, in many ways, I think a meeting on, on a video it's actually better than a meeting in person. I have my own volume control. I have my normal note taking apparatus. I have I have uh, uh, my own computer. Everything at my at my fingertips. You know, everything is here. I, I I actually kind of appreciate it sometimes. And and now with the, the translation and captioning services, uh, the the online meetings are becoming more inclusive. And so just a whole bunch of reasons are coming together where I think that that. Uh, uh, this one is here to stay. Companies are investing a lot of money right now to help their employees become productive at home, and they're going to want to return on that investment. Um, it, this isn't short-term stuff I'm hearing about. Companies are spending a lot of money to get everybody set up with the right equipment at home. Um, and, 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 and just one, actually, just one other point uh, with this COVID crisis um, is that we're finding that with everybody working at home, that it's the planet is becoming much healthier. Uh, we're seeing a dramatic decrease in air pollution. We're seeing a dramatic increase in a decrease in water pollution. Uh, there's climate concerns. Uh, bottom line is work from home is more sustainable. And so all of these things kind of coming together to me make this more of a permanent shift. Well, D- Dave, I want to jump- go ahead. Yeah, I want to jump in. I actually, a lot of what you said is profound. And I think um, in a, within a certain uh field of view is all accurate. I think, though, part of our problem, and, and this is a challenge I have a lot with the kind of work I do, and, um, I have a fully work from home organization. We have you know more than half a dozen analysts on our team. So we're a small firm, but I would say we're also larger than the average you know, one person, two per- And I've seen a lot of efficiencies and a lot of challenges going fully remote as we've grown our organization. Um, having talked to execs running large companies with mixed workforces in multiple locations. Um, and even talking, you know, I had a chance, I, I had a CEO of a company called Splunk on my podcast recently and talking to him and it was a great conversation, but you know, we talk about something we all learned in B school, which was essentially management by walking around and the ability to just get cube to cube, desk to desk, office to office in a given day. And yes, you can schedule meetings and yes, there's ad hoc pop-ups in, in chat and you can be chatting with someone and say, Hey, let's, you know, jump on and talk real quick. But you know, sometimes when you're trying to mobilize the troops, you're trying to get your team together, you're trying to engineer a new product, you're trying to um, come up with your best scrum meetings. I would still say that there's a lot of distractions on online meetings. There's a lot of multitasking that you wouldn't do in front of another person. My, my biggest assessment of everything you said is you're right, Dave, across the board, except the answer is not or, it's and. I think the answer is and. I think there's more. You know, I saw a placard or a, a meme that was kind of like a, a, a guy standing on the side and he said something like, we're going to find out if that, um, if that meeting really could have been an email. 
And the point is, is there are certain human conditions that have always caused us to have meetings that are longer than they should be, that have had us face to face when we don't need to be, or flying across the country when that could have been avoided. Video conferencing's worked for two decades. You know, we didn't have to fly from LA to New York to have a meeting at the bank. We like it. There's a part of it that likes it, but human happiness is important. And so what I'm saying is like, I'm, a, I'm an ambivert that leans on an intro side. I like being alone. I like working in my bubble. I don't really want to um, be face to face all the time, but that's a smaller part of the population. There's a very large part of the population that requires social interaction that like to be face to face with people that would prefer to me. So I think like everything it's, and I think the thing is here we can learn is we can have more meetings. We can be more efficient. And I think people are going to take that away. I think companies are going to build better infrastructure, be more prepared for this. But I think in the end, I always say, whether it takes you eight hours a day, two hours a day, or 20 hours a day, people know the work they need to get done. We need to enable them to do that in, in a multitude of environments that should include both remote, um, through technology and live through face to face. And I think we're a happier world when we get the right amount of social interaction and, and for everybody that's different. Daniel, yeah. I'll add to what you're saying, if I may, Scott, real quick, I, I think there's one point to reiterate that we're actually only in phase one of this home experiment right now. If, if you're listening to the experts, there's going to probably be another sheltered home wave coming in the future as well. But in the interim, there's going to be a chance where people have a chance to go back to the office. I think. In that time frame, we're going to see IT administrators looking to reevaluate what they're doing in-house and in, uh, communicating to the office. I think people are going to reevaluate rooms, huddle rooms, things like that. I think you can see resurgence in that. But this is only a phase one of phase two of this process. And, I, and there are two old terms that come to mind based upon, Daniel, what you said, and David, what you said. And I'm sure we'll have a new phrase for them. But one's going to be flex worker. I think you're going to have the idea of someone is now going to really be three days in the office or three days at home, two days in, at work, more broadly. I gave you that percentage before of like 42%. I think it's to be more broadly available to people. And the second thing is, Daniel, to your last point, I think that terminology management by objectives is gonna become more mainstream. I don't care, I don't need to tell you to get this done by Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's gonna be the end of the week. Did you get everything done you need to get done for that week? Because I'm allowing you the flexibility to work from home to be self-managed, to be self-regulated in your schedule and your time and your balancing of work life. Yeah, I, you know, and, and, and so Craig, I got a question for you and, and Jim, I want, want to hear your, your thoughts on this too, but I, we, we've touched on a few different things as it relates to this transformation, workplace transformation, right? The culture, how we work, what's, what, the, what the company environment and policies are, right? We've talked about the workflow and where we can work and how we can work the flexibility of that work, the tools that we can work with and the technology that can enable that. But, you know, now we're, now we're getting into this concept, this, the idea of the work space, right? Whether that's in our home, but, but also in the office and how important is the office? And what does that office environment need to be like uh, as we look at how the world of work is transforming? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first shot at that. I think we were already in that workspace transformation in work, hence the title of what we're talking about right now. In that workplace, there were a lot of factors driving change, everything from corporate real estate initiatives to facility management to um, employee optimization as well. The idea that I may not have the best employee within my five mile radius, but I might have somebody who's 50 miles away or 100 miles away. How do I enable to hire that person? I think a lot of those things are taking place, but, and just like David's example that the work from home um, uh, experiment here got a shot in its arm that really gave it a boost. I think the same thing is gonna take place in terms of transformation. So offices for many businesses are still gonna be an essential part of what takes place. They're gonna be the hub. They're gonna be the face-to-face. -face, they're gonna be the point in time that keeps things connected in a synergistic way. Um, some companies are able to do it without that, but many will still have to have that for a lot of reasons. Part of their workforce may still be uh, uh, facing uh, frontline. You know, part of their people may be service centered. Keep in mind that something like, uh, I think it's like uh, 25, 20, 30% are, are service centric in the, in the U.S. and what they're doing right now in terms of their employment. Um, <clears throat> I think we're going to see a boost, though, what takes place in terms of that transformation. So go back to the office place that, that seems so foreign, just last month that we were there. But we were having shared spaces. We were doing the idea of hoteling or hot desking. We were also doing things like uh, cafes that were enabled with technology or huddle rooms become more important again. I think you're gonna see a boost in the arm to that space idea taking place again, because what you'll have is this. 
remote workers, work from home enabled workers have to come to the mothership to do something. They're going to consolidate those spaces. They may or may not have a permanent desk, but they're going to need to be able to set up and be productive very quickly. Can I log on? Can I assume my identity? Can people know where I'm located? And then can I have access to the right technology, you know, the cloud-based services and whatever else? So um, I think you're going to see a, a, um, an increase in what's taking place there. It's going to be the second phase of what's going to take place of this whole COVID-19 um, um, change. Yeah. Jim, your, your thoughts. <laughs> Well, I think there's also generational differences that, uh, you know, we all need to look at. Uh, and I think, you know, for a lot of research firms, they do like work from home because, you know, they tend to, you know, like to have that freedom and that flexibility. Uh, I think, there's, uh, but, you know, I have, like I said, I have a lot of younger people and we do have a WeWork, Dave. And one of my uh, younger employees said the other day, I miss my WeWork. <laughs> By the way, that's relatively new, but we basically were talking to the associates, you know, surveys, just chat, and like, 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 we need a San Francisco office. And so, and by the way, I'm broadcasting from our office and, you know, my, nobody's here, but I can tell you the younger people do like that. And then there's this other thing, which is the fear of the executives, right? And out here in Silicon Valley, one of the fears of remote work is what happened to Yahoo. And so I can tell you for a fact that some of the big tech firms in Silicon Valley are worried, which is what the CEO of Yahoo figured out when she went there, uh, that no one was working, they were not logging in. And so there's this thing, if you're gonna do remote work, you actually absolutely have to have objectives. Uh, you're, it puts a lot of pressure on managers to make sure work is getting done. And for the associates to know, what am I supposed to do? And I think for the younger generation that's never done it, they are freaking out. So I think there's that dichotomy of, hey, we're going to do it. But like when you wake up, what, did you, what is your job and what are you going to do? And like I said, that's one of the things that Facebook is afraid of, Google is afraid of, uh, maybe not Cisco. Uh, I mean, I think Cisco has been around a little bit longer, but I can tell you they, they talk about that a lot, which is why at Facebook, the Sun Microsystems logo in Menlo Park, when you drive out of that parking lot, it's still there because they want everybody to remember that, look, a company can die. And I'm not saying that's the reason Sun did, but you know that's really one of the big things, which is why you have to go to work at some of those places. You have to get on the bus and you have to go there. And I don't think when this changes, that's gonna change at all because that's part of their company culture. So there's a cultural thing, uh, but I think there's also a fear uh, because you know, like I said, a lot of people at a lot of companies, when you say, do they really know what they're doing? And do they really come to the office? And do they do work or do they just kind of hang out? And so that's the other aspect of that that, Sometimes we are free to talk about. 20, 2020 will mark the beginning of a long decline in office commercial office space is my prediction. And I, you know, we've seen it in retail space for the past 10, 15 years uh, as people slowly move to buying online and uh, and giving up. I remember my I remember trying to explain to my dad in the 1992, maybe why I bought a book online and he was like, you know, why wouldn't you just go to a bookstore? It, it was, it was unfathomable back then to, in, in, you know, to, 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 to give up that retail experience. But I think we're going to give up that office experience. I think Craig said it right. That when he said that some people may not have permanent desk. And so what's going to happen is a lot of companies have, have expanded work at home initiatives over the past few years, but they haven't shrunk their commercial footprint. Um, I think we're going to see a dramatic shrinking of the commercial footprint a after this experiment that we're in right now, a lot of companies are going to say, well, well, gosh, I, you were working at home for the last few months and I noticed your productivity didn't go down. Why, why, uh, why should I pay for this office space anymore? And so we're going to get into this, uh, 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 abandonment of office spaces and the office will become a place to collaborate there'll be lots of huddle rooms there'll be lots of of uh, hoteling spaces and and you know, fixed wall offices that you can borrow or cube spaces that you can borrow i think this idea of the assigned uh cube in an open floor plan is going to be something we're going to joke about for the rest of the uh for the future that we, that's what we did for a while in the in the uh the late in 2019 um and and uh the office is going to become much more about collaborative uh, uh discussions and and you know the kinds of things that that i think craig was talking about it's that and thing you do you do some stuff at home you do some stuff at the office but the idea of the permanent desk will probably go away at the office so there's Dave's We're, next prediction. There you go. We have it on record right there. Scott, there's a major, 
there's a major real estate consideration. I, I know that this isn't a podcast about real estate or a, a web event, but boy, if that is real, we're going to have some serious uh, uh, redeployment of real estate and, and re-engineering of cities. And, and I mean, think about the Valley if 80%, 70% or New York City, if 80% or 70% of workers didn't have to come to work. I mean, I'm not saying it won't happen. I'm just saying that one thing that most uh, of us, and, and, and maybe most of us isn't fair because we all have our own assessments and use of tools and analytics, but many people tend to fail to incorporate into their models is human behavior and how slow people actually change. Um, you have to model that in. And as you model that in, like I said, for 20 years, we could have been doing all of our events online. There's a reason that hasn't changed. It has nothing to do with the ability to deliver content. It has everything to do with behavioral changes. Organizations have large event planning teams. They got very used to having these events where face-to-face -face meetings and products were shown off. Like, I'm just saying you're not wrong because companies have been redeploying workers to flex for a long time, but they're also making massive investments in new corporate headquarters that expansively host huge volumes of people. Um, the behavior, again, it's it's just because you can doesn't mean we will. And I think yeah. to some extent we could for a long time, but I still think even after this, slowly over the period of a year or two years, we will creep back because this, the human condition is not to change greatly, even in the most dire circumstances. The human condition doesn't change naturally very quickly, but w we have external forces at play here right now. And, that, and and so for years, working at home has had kind of a stigma, just a, just a little bit of a stigma, and it's getting less and less. I'm, I'm predicting that in the next five years, working at the office might have a stigma. Oh, yeah, I, I commute in every day and work in an office. It's like, really? So, uh, oh. are you are you untrustworthy? Are you incapable of working on your own? I mean, what's wrong with you? You know, I I, th I think the I think things are going to change, and to your point, slowly. Well, but, I want to I just want to I want to make one enunciation, Dave, on your point, and I think there's a situational aspect of work that does tie into, for example, you can't make cars working remote. You have to have a factory, right? And my argument is, product teams. It's very hard to make a product. Uh, when everybody's work from home, because you just can't get the collaboration. When you're trying to get a product. That's true, Jim, but it's also changing. The the the, yeah. the latest Swatch is made 100% by machines, and and they still call it a Swiss watch because the machines are in Switzerland. But but they could theoretically move those machines. But but anyway, but but more and more car production is becoming automated. Not 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 100%, but yes, and we're seeing and very automated. But my point is is that. Um, there, that you're still going to see, I mean, and I think it's already been priced into the real estate market. You are going to see smaller footprints, but out here, there is a massive, massive war for real estate. And I, that has not slowed down at all. I think people will be smarter about it, but I think when you got, you know, you know, young companies and if you look at, you know, all the different countries trying to do innovation, you get a small team together. Now, can you do it real? You absolutely can but, you know, from what I've seen over the years, the companies that were together generally got products shipped faster. And so I think you'll see optim optimized uh, uses of that. But I think that, you know, again, if it was just knowledge workers dealing with information, we could make your argument all day long. But when you're dealing with other things relative to having to get real products shipped, I think that the the physical team is going to outrace the remote team every single time. There's, there's lessons. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. There's lessons we can learn from sister industries here. Um, uh, if you think about it, our, our ecosystems, our verticals, whatever you want to say. And I think you're right. We're going to get more crisp about when we have to be in person to collaborate. Look at what some schools have done in terms of what they call uh, upside down classrooms. David, you and I were talking about this on a call about a month ago, right? And, and after you introduced this idea to me, I went and did some more research on it, which is great. There's some schools out there that are having their kids actually start at home listening to a pre-recorded lecture from, from the professor. It's the static part of the information that they can do in their own time and consume. And then going into the classroom in the physical environment, the discussion, the quiz, for the activity that requires the human interaction. Your homework. Yeah, exactly. School to do your homework. It's, a, it's an interesting model. And I think what might apply to this is uh, reserving that there is physical products, physical people that need to get in place for the knowledge workers, I think we're, we might, we have the opportunity to get more crisp about when we have to be in person to collaborate and when we can do things remotely. 
So one area that I think is another area that's, that is kind of going through this change, and, and to, your, to all your points, like flexibility and the and, right, option is, is, is I think, going to be critical and, and key as we see things move to the, to the future. But one area that I see is, is in these contact centers, these call centers, where it used to be, talk about, you know, management by walking around, you'd have this rows, rows right, of, of people who are in the, the call centers doing the customer service, working with people close to their manager if they have questions or whatnot. Again, now they're being affected and, and, and being asked to work from home. And I, I, you know, I'm curious to get your thoughts on how just even in that segment and area, things are transforming. Can they do that work from home? Well, so you know, it's, it's a, I, I, sorry, I, Dave, I want to get, let's get your thoughts. I want to say that I had a call United Airlines to uh, cancel one of my flights, and I actually asked the agent about this, and she said she was indeed at home, and I was really impressed by that, actually, because I didn't think United would be that quick uh, with that kind of re uh, response. But the number one objection, we, this doesn't even come up yet, the number one objection to telework is basically how do I know that the person is working? How do I know they're being productive? And when it comes to contact center agents, I mean, there there are no employees in an organization that are more monitored, more analyzed than a contact center agent. Uh, we have so many tools, real-time data on calls, real-time data on outcomes, real-time data on sentiment of the, uh, now we're getting into customer satisfaction, things like CloudSherry that you guys recently acquired in Cisco, uh, AI-based uh, quality metrics, again, in real time i mean there, there you can't you can't be unproductive or unsuccessful as a contact center agent for very long anymore um and 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 the kicker here is that they're coming to work and they're not even talking to people at work right they're talking to customers who are calling in on 800 lines or somewhere else. they're not they're not even they're not even coming in to, for face to face interactions they're coming in for remote interactions so it really kind of makes no sense at all uh for a contact center agent to be in a contact center in my opinion um and and when you when you open up the idea of a remote contact center um uh, again, you've got the, the first concerns are around productivity. I just addressed that. The second concern is around um, uh, uh, the, the overall, you know, quality. Is there dog barking and stuff like that? But again, these these AI tools that are monitoring the calls, they could detect this stuff quicker than they could if there was noise in the line of the office, right? So, so all this technology is kind of coming together. But the other thing that happens when you have remote agents is you act, you get access to the gig economy, which is what, you know, Uber taught us all about. The gig economy has all these qualified people that could do a great job, particularly as a call, as a contact center agent, that may not be somebody who is eligible for a normal job. Maybe it's a college student. Maybe it's a stay-at-home mom that only has a few hours a day. Or, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why people can't join the workforce full-time, but they're perfectly capable of working for two or three hours a day. And and you act, you get access to these people. And and I interestingly enough, with contact centers, that's the way volumes are, right? There we have a peak hour, we have a peak two hours. It's that it's that it's that uh certain time rush around sunset in on the East Coast that we that we get all of our calls. And so, and so that gig economy is perfect for that. Um, and so I really believe that the uh, contact center agent is the ideal candidate for somebody to work at home. Yeah, I, I, and, and you know, like you said, a lot of intelligence that can be fed to them and armed so that, especially as companies go through the seasonality, right, of where they need to hire more for different seasons, right, and re retail or whatnot. And instead of having people come into an office and train them, the insights and the intelligence, the AI capabilities can feed them information in real time and they can be trained at home in real time. It's, we're, we're seeing, you know, so, so you can do what you do, seasonality and from home and that gig economy feeds right, right into that. I think that's, that's, that's an interesting insight. So speaking of, of AI, Jan, I want to get your thoughts on this. Um, what, where else are we seeing AI train, change the way that we work, the way that we collaborate and, is it something that's going to continue in the future? Yeah, well, I think, I think, I think oh, sorry, fourth, go ahead. the fourth industrial revolution, I think, is here. And uh, that means intelligence and automation. So we're seeing that show up in the collaboration communications market with things like auto transcription, note taking, um, auto connect for meetings. Um, that, but, you know, the ability for applications to 
understand what's happening and also to predict, uh, you know, predict what's going to happen. Um, see that in spades. It's still pretty early days. There's a lot of people that say they have AI that don't. Um, I particularly like the Cisco Cognitive collaboration with the company acquisition and all the stuff you've done there as well as, well as um, the uh, conversational AI app, you know, firm that you bought, Voicea. I think you guys have been pushing the envelope um, and I'm not, not sure that everybody sees that there are quiet moves that many providers have been making to prepare for the future. Uh, our take is you can't outsource AI. You can partner for it initially, but eventually every product manager will have to be an expert in AI if you're going to really survive in the coming wave of, it, of the intelligence economy. So, uh, like I said, it's, it's here. It's uh, still early days, uh, but again, many of the industry leaders are are pushing the envelope, and I would put Cisco as one of them. Yeah, and Daniel, you were going to mention something. I don't know if you want to talk about it. I've got another question for you, but go ahead if you wanted to say something about the AI. No, sorry, I, I thought that was directed to me. Um, you know, I was probably, my brain might have been multitasking at that moment. Uh, no, I, I mean, I'll quickly comment so you can keep things moving along, but AI is going to infiltrate every single thing we do. It already is infiltrating almost everything we do. It's a matter of whether or not we're identifying it, feeling it, and, and seeing it. And the thing about it is, is the more transparent and ubiquitous, uh, and I'm gonna add some other buzzwords, I'll come back to those, it is, um, the more meaningful and useful it will be. Because um, there's the data science side of AI, which is incredibly complex. We're seeing it right now in the midst of COVID-19, all these models, that are being built that are going to show us what may happen. This is really ML and AI being put to work. Um, but in most of our lives, it's like Netflix telling us what show we might want to watch, or you know, it's a transcription service in an enterprise meeting that might be able to help us identify the most important components of a one hour long meeting uh, without having to do a lot of processing or having an extra person in the room. Um, it's the ability for your ERP systems to identify trends that might uh, reduce risk of having product uh, product shortages in, in import, at important times or making sure customers and identifying who might not pay you. So these are a lot of things that AI is doing. It's very much there. Even right now in the remote work, we're seeing a huge spike in ransomware and cybersecurity attacks on companies. And those, for instance, AI, um, ML and, and threat detection are hum playing humongous roles in terms of keeping enterprises and people safe. Um, but again, most people don't realize it because AI deployed well in most applications will not be visible to the consumer or the enterprise user. Yeah. Great, uh, that's good insight. So to kind of switching tracks, I got another question here for you around security. Daniel, I know, I know you talked about security and, and written about it a, a bit but how are companies dealing with security and privacy issues, um, net, you know, even before this, and now that a lot of people are working from home, but, but how, how, how are they dealing with it? And why is it so important in collaboration? Yeah, it's, um, there's a million directions you could take this, Scott. And so uh, first thing I'm gonna point out is security and privacy are both very important and they're not the same. And I, by the way, make the mistake consistently of talking about them together and because of the way my mind works, sometimes I float between the two in the same thought, um, but not everybody follows me. So first and foremost, as companies go remote, um, you, you're starting to limit control because you're asking and giving more accessibility to the worker to do more things um, without as much guidance, without being connected to the network, without guaranteeing security. Things, a lot of cloud applications can be run off the VPN which means, sure, maybe their company asks you to do it, but do people have that behavior of every time they get on, making sure they connect to the VPN before they go online? It's little behaviors, but that difference could be the difference between secure data being uh, potentially accessed based on making the decision to click the wrong link in an email. I mean, it's as simple as that. That's how this starts. Um, but let's, let's pivot really quick. So we'll go from security over to privacy. So really quickly, to finish my thought on security, so a lot of companies looked at SaaS, for instance, as the way forward. So they're deploying collaboration apps, uh, persistent messaging or pervasive messaging applications, um, you know, Salesforce administration, project, project management apps. And there's a lot of really cool apps that are being developed with an enterprise-like feel, with enterprise-like capabilities that aren't necessarily um, 
treated the way a company, you know, like your company, Cisco, you know, I'll just use an example. The amount of investment you guys do with White Hat, with companies basically trying to penetrate your networks and trying to um, cause you guys uh, mayhem, as our friends at Allstate might say, it, that is an investment that companies must make because the only way of really knowing how strong your networks are is, is having the best types of hackers trying to hack you. And that's when you learn what you really are made of. Well, a lot of these small companies up in Cone, they're, they're getting bespoke groups within large enterprises to download their softwares and use them for enterprise to share information on projects, on customers, on potentially sensitive project data, um, on their meeting platforms, on their collab platforms, on their project management tools. And these tools are not vetted completely. They have less stringent uh, privacy and security. Um, you know, I've written about this and listen, um, I'm sure it'll make you happy for me to say this. And I just have to honestly say it as an analyst, I've looked very carefully at Zoom and, and I like Zoom in a lot of ways, but you just need to read their privacy policy to at the very least take pause at the fact that the data is being transmitted and shared with advertisers. It's just very clearly in there that your meeting data is being shared. It doesn't explicitly say a lot of what it's being shared for and what exactly, but it says your likeness, the information of who you are, ident personal identifiers. Um, but then you look at, you know, so look at what WebEx does, look at what Microsoft Teams does. Their privacy policies are both very explicit that we don't do this. And if we were going to do this, you will be notified and have the opportunity to opt out before we share. So this has a lot to do, and, and I'm sure everyone here is ready to weigh in, so I'll try to close my thoughts here, but this has a lot to do with the way these companies were born. Some of these companies were born to be enterprise companies, and some of these solutions were born to be consumer and be in the app era. And those companies tend to be more following that privacy footprint of like social media firms, like a Facebook, like a Google, like a Twitter, where advertising is a little bit more the bend than necessarily being a secure enterprise software. But in the, in the end, as these bespoke tools and these scrum tools become enterprise-wide deployments, I do think CIOs and IT decision makers are going to have to vet and look very hard and hold their, the software providers responsible to offer a highest level of security and data privacy um, as they move forward, both from a compliance and standpoint, from a sovereignty standpoint, from a governance standpoint, and from an enterprise data protection standpoint. So I'll, uh, I'll get off my, uh, my bandwagon here and I'll let everybody else jump in. Yeah, any, any other thoughts on that? I, you know, I, you, you've covered a lot there. Any, anyone have other thoughts or opinions on that? I'll just say that uh, I, I've always been a big proponent of uh, encryption and the only encryption that matters is end-to-end -end encryption that has uh, customer controlled keys. Um, I would encourage any organization to use that uh, and use it while you can, because I think one of the outcomes of this COVID might be uh, uh, more pressure ought to eliminate, uh, more political pressure to eliminate encryption. But uh, but right now it's legal, and I recommend that uh, organizations always use that. All right. That sounds good. Um, so we've touched a little bit, just kind of changing gears here too. We've touched a little bit about obviously the knowledge workers, people work from home, um, but some of these 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 deskless workers or frontline workers, this just becomes a little bit of a challenge because they 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 do have to be in a you know a physical space, a, a working environment, retail or whatever it might be, restaurants. But still, there's got to be something that that is enabled them to to connect, to get information quick, to find information quick. Where do we see this 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 era of frontline workers going? What's going to help them to transform the way they work? So, Dave, I don't know if you want to start. I'm glad you use the word uh, uh, deskless because uh, I never know whether I'm supposed to use first line or 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 frontline or whatever. I like deskless. Deskless is the better word, in my, in my opinion. But um, uh, yeah, and it's come up several times in this conversation already. Uh, there's definitely a uh, this, uh, dichotomy ha occurring between the knowledge workers and the and the deskless workers, and we see this very clearly now with the pandemic going on. That we need, we rely on these 
deskless workers to bring us our packages, to bring us our groceries, to stop to stock the grocery shelves, etc. And and uh, as Jim pointed out earlier, that um, you know these these aren't going away through automation anytime soon. Um, and so we need to figure out how to how to support them better. Uh, today, there's largely done. Uh, with two separate pieces that both need improvement. Um, one is uh, the smartphone. The smartphone has been absolutely uh, amazing technology that it's probably, uh, 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 well, the smart, everyone has a smartphone and that's, and, and they're designed to be portable and it's, you know, much more. Uh, a lot of people don't realize how few people have desktop computers or even phones or voicemails and stuff like that. In enterprise communications, we talk about enterprise wide uh, phone systems, and you know they they, they touch maybe fifty percent of the employees, um, and and so uh, everyone has a smartphone, and that's a really important thing to be able to leverage. The other one is messaging apps, um, and in the case of Cisco, it's WebEx Teams, but what messaging apps are combined with smartphones, uh, probably the first way to get. Uh, enterprise-wide communications that we've ever had, really. I mean, I mean, like I said, phones didn't work, email accounts didn't work, uh, but to get to reach every possible employee in a large organization, uh, we finally have this as a possibility with uh, uh, messaging apps and and uh, smartphones. Now we've got a couple of problems. Um, the the uh, messaging apps don't necessarily scale to every employee, and so uh, that's one problem that uh, is impacting some solutions. Another another problem is that the um, messaging apps only work internally, and sometimes we need to work with external folks, uh, particularly in certain job roles. Uh, and so again, some solutions have that built in. Some solutions use uh, gateway services. Um, I believe WebEx has it built in, and so. Um, uh, so that that's an important feature, and then the other thing is the, that's kind of broken is is to a degree the smartphone. And there's a lot of confusion around you know should an employee use their own personal device? What happens to uh, corporate information on that device? Do we need to secure that differently? Do we have does a corporation have access to other information on that personal device? And and I think the answer is going to kind of shake out here uh, fairly soon that uh, we're going to have to reinvent the smartphone for work. And, you know, we've seen UPS do that. They have their own devices that they use when they go door to door the delivery. We've seen other companies use uh, other kinds of customized devices. Uh, we need to get past the customized devices to a general purpose smartphone type of idea that can go to um, every, that, 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 that can work in any industry and any type of vertical, whether it be, uh, you know, retail or healthcare or whatever. And, and, I, and I imagine that's coming in the not too distant future and, and uh, basically basically the next version of a smartphone, a smarter phone for enterprise. Awesome. All right. Any any last, uh, any other thoughts on that deskless worker space from anyone? Yeah, I would, I would just say that there are, you know, I mean, there are tools that can help manage, you know, uh, the devices, you know, enterprise information management, uh, you know, and enterprise and mobile device management tools. So, yeah, there are. There are there. I'm glad you said that. There are, they are out there. They can segment. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of firms haven't used them, though, to Dave's point about, you know, lack of deployment. Uh, large enterprises have. There's a lot of bring your own. I do think that, you know, there's still an argument in, in uh, a lot of development teams about, you know, uh, browser-based apps, you know, with mobile-friendly versus native mobile apps. And I think, uh, you know, uh, a really good uh, native mobile app that might be designed for a remote worker is going to blow away from a speed efficiency, uh, you know, just the web-based uh, responsive uh, web app. So I think that's one of the things when you actually look at remote work. Uh, it's about time and speed, and so I think there are a lot of lessons learned from some of the first-line worker things where you got to have a, a unique device. Uh, but uh, but I I would just say that you know um, a lot of people kind of poo poo it, but you know, micro companion devices, one of these tablets. So uh, while the phone is there, I depend more on the tablet as something uh, that I kind of kind of look where it is if it's not next to me because I kind of use it as a tandem kind of device. And so I don't know that we've really learned how to optimize that. And you know, screen real estate. Some people like one screen. Some people like two screens. Uh, big displays for remote work can be tremendous benefits. So I think looking at the footprint, uh, there are a lot of aspects that people need to look at for remote work at home. Uh, and uh, and again, this is 
for people that haven't done it, it's early days. I used to have two screens, two machines. Um, and I can tell you, when I came back to the office, it was a weird feeling for a couple of years coming back to an office. But now it's kind of like I feel weird if I'm going to work uh, at home because, you know, uh, it's it's a nice uh, kind of corporate setup that we have. So I think, like I said, I think the big thing is we are going to look at the world differently because it's a global world and companies are going to have to be much more set up for redundancy and for, hey, we got to work at home because, you know, it's flu season again. I think that's going to be one of the, basically the new normals that we're going to have. It's a good point. It's a good point. So we, we've reached the end uh, of our of our time here. We've had a great discussion. I think we've covered a lot of different topics around work, right? The future of work, how work is going to happen. But I, I do want to give each of you 30 seconds to a minute to just give a little last bit of advice or or takeaways that you would like to emphasize before we end. Just kind of get your thoughts and closing thoughts before we we uh, end our our our, uh, our session here. So Craig, let's let's start with you, and then we'll go down the line. Yeah, um, I'll try this, and this is kind of towards those IT decision makers or business decision makers, and they're thinking about this transformation from what's taking place in the office to this home hybrid environment. In the past, it was about three things, your workforce, your workflows, and your workplaces. And I think the same thing applies. I think you can leverage that same model, but update it to how people are going to be working in multiple locations, be it a home environment like we're all doing here on this call, going into the work, and the combination then of flowing seamlessly between the two. I, I think the models are still there. You just have to apply them to this new paradigm. Good point. Thanks, Craig. Jim, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, one thing for a lot of the managers listening to this and a lot of the individual workers, I think one of the ideas that we've been promoting and uh, we've blogged about this podcast is the idea of a work buddy. And so when you talk about this remoteness, so the idea of having a work buddy you chat with every day not just your boss. I'm talking about somebody that you work with as a team member. Basically, it says, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? And I did that actually when I ran my remote team. We do that actually here at Aragon. That is a tremendous way to keep the connectedness and to eliminate that feeling of isolation. And so if you're a team manager and you got a team, you know, do this work buddy program. I'm going to be blogging about that. But I think that's one of the things that can really help the remote uh, isolation factor and keep that culture thing going. Love it. That's a, that's a good, it's a good thought. We'll, we'll watch for that. Dave, closing thoughts from you. Uh, my bit of advice for people to do to uh, remote work is to overly communicate. Uh, it, uh, it'll become natural over time, but you don't realize, or a lot of people don't realize how much we communicate without trying in an office you know you might see somebody has a new car a uh, new hairstyle a new outfit whatever you see these things and you may or may not comment about them but even just if you react about them whatever there's this kind of communication that always occurs in an office when you are remote you have to deliberately make these communications happen you have to you know nod on a video call you have to reply to an email when you may not have necessarily needed to in person uh you need to you know uh, I love the messaging apps have emotions and uh, uh, you can kind of state that or, or change your presence to indicators, uh, things like that. You have to overly communicate to compensate for the fact that you're not making that uh, uh, casual uh, casual observations and seeing people. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Dave. And Daniel, your thoughts? Yeah, this is a, a, a very complex topic with a lot of diverse considerations. Um, I want to end this talking about the workers themselves and, and, and the social norms. I think there's a lot of information out there, including that from people like me. And I'll write an article. I actually have something going up on Forbes later today talking about uh, optimizing remote work. And one of the things is I think for everyone is going to be working in a way, learning to work in a way that's best for you. Um, everybody's giving tips right now, whether it's get up and shower and get dressed like everybody else does, whether it's, you know, continuing to mix in exercise routines, whether it's, you know, how you should deploy an office or, you know, separating yourself from your family. And, 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 and what I'm saying is in these times, and I want to be really considerate uh, and have a lot of compassion towards the moment we're in, because um, to a lot of what we discussed in the future, this might be different. And as this becomes our real norm, the process might be different, but right now I think it's 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 really a mix of doing what you feel you can be most productive at, um, 
building a routine that's comfortable for you. As humans, we all operate differently. For years, I've been more than capable of rolling out of bed in my gym shorts and a t-shirt and being extremely productive. So while for some experts that are gonna write productivity articles on Inc., they're gonna tell you this is the steps. I think it's about finding your productivity. And, and the one other thing, and I know this, um, Scott probably is a little bit off the, the, the conversation, but I think is really important is limit your access to media and news right now, because it is, if you wanna get work done, because I'm being sincere, because we track the news. This is as analysts, our job, and we're following the markets, but this is, a, uh, this is a situation that is going to have constant evolution. The news cycle is designed to keep us tuned in and anxious, but for us to be productive at work, we need to be dialed into the work. We need to be focused on what we're doing. So kind of I, I, if I do give a tip to anything, you know, kind of set times in the day to consume outside, but really focus yourself in on, on trying to do as much uh, within that comfort zone as possible. Because the anxiety right now with COVID-19, the constant flow of bad news, you know, as companies, we are going to come out the other side of this. This will be abated. And whether it's in four weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks, life will return to a more normal state. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to remember that. And I think if anything, these tools should connect us and bring us closer as companies. It should enable us to be more productive and do more. And as we learn from this, we're going to come out the other end, more transformed, more digital, more knowledgeable, and, and, and more learned about how to work this way. But concurrently, this isn't the way it's going to be forever. And so, you know, my tip, like I said, start, find your best routine and know this isn't forever. Um, and keep those kind of positive thoughts in your mind as much as you can as we try to move forward. Okay. Yeah. Love great points as well. So thank you. And and as we close this, you know, I want to especially thank each of you for, for coming on and participating with us. So Daniel and Jim and, and and Dave and Craig, thank you for doing this. And I encourage all of you who are viewing this and listening to this to follow each of these analysts on their you know, very active socially, but they write a lot in these different platforms and do a lot of research and as well as these research projects come out, uh, please uh, go and, and, and take a look at what they're saying. And, and as you, each of you have said, this continues to evolve. You are learning new things as we go. This workplace transformation is a topic and the future of work and remote work is something that we're gonna be learning about, talking about, a lot as, as we go forward. I think we're at the beginning stages of it. So again, thank you each of you for coming on. We appreciate it. And with that, we will close our series and uh, we thank each of you for uh, taking the time to, uh, to be with us during this uh, Workplace Transformation Virtual Summit. And uh, we hope you have learned a lot and have enjoyed it and to continue to, to, to follow us as we talk about a lot of this on the future work.webex.com. Thank you everyone. We'll see you next time. Take care.